Good evening, everyone, and welcome to another edition of Tuesday Night Live, brought to you by Crowcast. Another jam-packed show for this evening with a couple of great wins over the weekend, uh, a historic event down at West Lakes, and lots of other stuff to talk about. So, without any further ado, let's get right into it. Introducing our panel tonight, we have Nikki. How are you going, Nick? I'm going very well. Good to hear, Maka. How are you doing? Uh, lovely, relaxed. I'm sure I won't be by the end of the show. Mrs. Macca, how are you going? Oh, she's doing well. She's doing the dishes. Good yeah. girl. <laughs> and Donk, how are you going? And the chuckle uh, in the background. How are you going, Donkey? Yeah. Yeah, all is well in the north. The White all Walkers is... aren't here yet. <laughs> uh, not long now, only about a month. I, know, I, am, I am peeling off the walls. Absolutely pumped. <laughs> just just you, about to... And, uh, and Donkey... Sk- I was just going to say that Donkey's a bit of a media star at the moment. He is. Yeah, well, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty hard not to get too starstruck if you're a photographer in this town and bump into the Donk. Um, there's not much you can do. <laughs> I don't think it's you, Matt. I think it's your daughter. Let's be honest. Yeah, no. she's, she is a, she's a superstar and she's already got the little diva attitude to boot. So um, it, is, uh, uh, it runs in the family, I think. Uh, for those of you uh, who are confused by this particular conversation, have a look at AFL.com uh, down in the AFL news, I think it's the news desk they call it. Um, there's a, an article regarding uh, increase in participation in the AFL and there's a certain one donkey and his daughter who feature as the photo that accompanies the article. So well done. Yeah, it was very exciting times. It was we got the we got both captains and half the team um, in the fo- in to sign the ball, and the ball went and slept in the cot that night. So uh, it was all very exciting for all involved on uh, on the uh, against Frio the other week. It was fantastic. What I'd just like to explore is your blatant exploitation of your of your daughter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah every good parent knows how to do it. Come at me, bro. <laughs> oh, what's going on here? Hang on, I've got double up here. I don't, <laughs> What's going sorry, on? Sorry, I had double up there. That was weird. <laughs> As I was saying, Donkey, I'd just uh, like to explore the issue of the exploitation of your daughter just to get on the AFL website. Well, it, it, okay, I know, I know it probably looks like that, but um, she was uh, she was front and center all night. So when the uh, when the girls were doing warm ups uh, and all the stretching, she was sitting there on the concourse doing her stretches, Murphy style, um, in the stands. And uh, she's sitting there with the pen in her hand and the ball, waiting to go for the last half of the last quarter. So uh, I was just doing the holding. She was uh, she was doing all the directing. Um, uh, but like a true diva, uh, it just looks like I was um, I was the one pushing, but it was all her, trust me. Well, look, no Pete tonight. He's got a uh, unforeseen circumstance, so you're going to have to put up with me directing you guys. So if you don't listen, I'm just going to cut you off. Uh, but without any further ado, <laughs> let's get into some news, shall we? I guess we should start off with the uh, unfortunate demise of Footy Park. I don't know. It's unfortunate. It's fantastic. Oh, I don't well, know. There's a lot of memories there. There are indeed a lot of memories there, Donk. Yeah, oh, I was. I moved to Darwin, so I was cold every yeah. time I went there. Adelaide yeah. was fantastic. Well, I used to always be in a corporate box there, so I used to love it. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> And then there were those of us who sat in the outer. Uh, no. Or like my parents, I I actually do remember my parents would take me to like the SNFL games there when I was really little. And this is going to show my age a little bit. So the stand was up and the members were only in that upper stand. Um, it was still a concourse down underneath what we then know in the AFL as being the members, it wasn't down there. So the parents would would sit up the back, one on either side of an aisle, and I used to have free range to run up and down so they could keep me in their peripheral vision but watch the footy. I thought that was very clever parent um, yep. parenting on my parents' behalf there. Nothing like a bit of black bell. Um, but, uh, no, I used to have a mate that used to have a corporate box, and, um, but he was a port supporter, and uh, the deal was... 
I had to go and watch the bloody Port games as well. So if I wanted to go and see the Adelaide games... Well, at least you, you could stretch your legs out every second week. Well, <laughs> <laughs> you think you're joking, but you're not. <laughs> <laughs> That's why that was the deal, because he couldn't get a full box for a Port game. But, uh, no, look, it used to be free food, free drink. Why, why wouldn't you go? Oh, absolutely. Um, look, my fondest memories are not Crows related. They're the 74 and 76 grand finals, Mackie. You would uh, remember those. Uh, fam- <laughs> famous victories. Uh, famous victories over the Port Magpies and 76, I think, the all-time record for attendance with people sitting inside the fence. I was there, actually. <laughs> Fortunately, I wasn't in that part of the ground. No. Don't tell me about those. I can't believe they actually did that because, um, you know, when the players were chasing the ball, the boundary, they're ending up ending up in the spectators and mainly kids sitting all around the boundary. Yeah, well, there were. Uh, there were. Uh, I remember them letting people in. It was after. I'm pretty sure it was after the start of the game that they let people in and. Um, I was sitting at the member. I was fortunate enough. My uh, my grandfather, uh, who was quite a religious man, um, snuck me and my mate into both of those grand finals. So <laughs> I sat in the members for free both games. But uh, as a as a how old would I have been in seventy six? I would have been eight or nine or something. Um, but that was the that was a grand final that was unlosable for Port and uh, Rick Davies just went crazy and uh, that was the end of that. Yeah, he was a very good player, Rick Davies. Uh, he, he's very, very short for a, a ruckman to come forward, but the six guy was one. a star. I reckon he was 6 1, Macca. Yeah, absolute star. Six I mean, one. he just was a star. Um, but even with the Crows, so it's some fantastic memories. I remember, um, you know, obviously the first trial game and the first game against uh, Hawthorne, and uh, the trial game was against Essendon. And. Uh, they were amazing experiences and so many state of origin games as well that uh, that were fantastic during the 80s there and then of course we had the showdowns and and the epic uh, semi-final showdown and lots of other games so i mean you know it's great that we're at adelaide oval and it's great that uh, that we're continuing to pack houses and all the rest of it but uh, a lot of people are quick to ride off footy park but for its time it was a fantastic venue and uh, you know, we can't ever forget that that was the uh, that was the birthplace of the Adelaide Crows. It well, was my... indeed, and I miss I miss the barbecues. That was yeah. such a unique thing, and we did a barbecue every week. I think Dad cooked on a little tiny round, like the the little camping one. Um, he cooked for fourteen people, and we had gourmet barbecues. We'd have other people who drove and parked in the regular spots would come like when the gates open like we did come and check what was on the menu this week so i i miss that i didn't just check it nicky i used to scrounge them <laughs> no you had to pay <laughs> <laughs> but uh my, my my one big memory of footy park is that mark that mod took against north melbourne in the forward pocket down the southern end oh, God, I, yeah. I, oh that, that was so good that that that's my one big memory of Footy Park. I've never seen a mark like it before or since. The guy was, got up, got up so high that he just hovered up there and waited for the ball. I was directly in line with the kick from McGuinness. Yeah. So where he kicked it from, and just seeing that go there. The other really memory, the big memory I have is actually the state game where we beat Victoria and Tony Hall kicked that goal oh, from the yeah, Tony from Hall the pocket. pocket. And I was actually seated in the members' stand because that's so tightly packed. The guy behind me got excited and he jumped up and kneed me in the back of the head, but I didn't care because, my God, that goal was good. Yeah, uh, and, of course, Bungie sort of <laughs> having a breakout game against Hawthorne when he kicked that uh, left-foot dribbler from the pocket to get us over the line uh, and really sort of uh, staked his claim as an emerging talent and he went on to play some amazing games at Footy Park and... Um, you know, we've had a couple of people on Twitter mention a couple of things. Uh, DSG, John Roberts kicking 16 uh, <laughs> at Footy Park. Did anyone actually see that? Because DSG reports there was only 3,000 there. I wasn't one of them. <laughs> no. Uh, and all, J-Mac uh, talks about a, a game in uh, 2002 where uh, 
he was there on a mate's buck show and uh, a lovely old lady was sitting behind him but uh, as soon as the game started she went full feral and uh, taught him a few words that he may, may or may not have realised. And Ben also, uh, Tex ripping free a new one in the 2012 semi. That was a great game and the uh, round 20 win versus Collingwood in 93 to get us in and almost uh, getting us uh, a flag really, a, a, a opportunity loss as we've said before. So, uh, you know, lots of memories of Footy Park. You, you forgot one. I was just reading The ultimate Twitter. showdown. No, I said yeah, that. the ultimate show. Oh, I did said you? That. Yeah, I said Miss that I was start. reading things. Come on, pay attention, please. <laughs> um, there I mean, still is one of the greatest piece of um, Tim Lane commentary, some showdown after halftime point. Port didn't bother to show up. I still love that. Well, the beauty of that is that Port will can say they have never beaten us in a final at uh, Footy Park. So, irrespective of if the uh, unthinkable happens and they beat us in a final at Adelaide Oval, they never beat us in a final at Footy Park. Anyway, let's move on uh, because there's some unfortunate, uh, well, not terrible, but unf- I just can't really work this one out. Tex, I don't even realise he got sighted and then all of a sudden he's uh, it's been upheld. There, what's I, going on? I saw the incident and, uh, and there is no way in the hell, in the way that, uh, no way in hell that uh, Tex actually tried to slam his head into the ground. He actually, as he's throwing the guy down, the guy sort of twisted and as a result, I don't think he's actually Created a situation where his head did hit the ground, but not slammed into the ground. But actually, and well, like Tex, he caused Tex the... actually didn't have control. No, no that's, that's what I'm right. saying. That was, that was my point. Tex's was, legs yeah. were in the air. That's exactly my whole point, Nicky. It wasn't Tex who hit, hit the guy's head in there. It just happened oh, that no. way because the way the guy moved as, as Tex gra- uh, grabbed him. Um, and I thought he'd get off for certain. So, but, you know, it, it's just it's a bloody raffle, isn't it? So we got, um, we've got... Two citations for striking. Now, I didn't see either inf- incident, so I don't know how severe they were, but striking is striking. They both get a $2,000 fine. Oh, and, come and, on. and Tex, <laughs> for a bloody falling over, gets a $3,000 fine. What the fuck? Honestly. Yeah. What, what about that bloody oh, Mumford? Oh. Mumford uh, got, he got suspended for a match, and he, then he got uh, reduced. I mean, for God's sake. Not- yeah, I'm sorry. The but, AFL said they were going to um, really um, crack down on the punching and the jumper punches. He punched the guy in the head. Nicky, they, you know why he got it reduced? Their argument by the guys that reduced it was that it wasn't intentional. The guys actually turned around, chased the guy and smashed him in the head. I don't, can't, cannot see how that's not intentional. I, I just don't understand it. I, I really don't. Um the, the tribunal needs to be overhauled. We we knew that last year there was no consistency. They've got one person in charge and he's useless and he's continuing on this year. Yeah, and he, and you also see the same thing. Like, I'm sorry, but Tegan Cunningham should not have been playing the other week. She actually play her on the ground and she's punched her. And it's yeah. clear that she, the fist comes back and she punched her. She's being held down by um, her other teammate and she did it. Nothing. Not a fine. No, but she, she's okay not, to play. I'm sorry. No. But the same guy that's actually uh, cited uh, Tex, Hardigan gives that bloke a crook old late clout around the oh, ear. He missed, thought, the, he missed the Macca. He, he got him with the top of the bicep. <laughs> it, it, it looked <laughs> like. But he had a go. Well, it, I don't know whether he had. Hardigan is he renowned for late. being very uncoordinated very when, he comes, <laughs> when he comes back. And that wasn't uncovered, no, no. Yeah. no, it actually was. I, I it was a late spoil. And the guy's come back and actually been hit by um, Hardigan's peck. Um, you know, there was hardly, there was incidental arm contact and certainly nothing else. And uh, Hardigan's fortunate that he didn't make contact, but I don't think it was an intentional swing. I think it was, it was his brain was still uh, uh, in rehab, I think. <laughs> where it often is, um, but he actually didn't play too badly, actually. Hardigan. Oh, I thought he did. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he, what he game were you watching? Uh, let's not go into yeah, match analysis. Uh, <laughs> yeah, what else have we got I here? <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't agree with you less, Macca. 
<laughs> well, what, actually, you don't get a drink thing, for that one. <laughs> the one thing we didn't talk about uh, last week uh, was the participation numbers that were released by the AFL and the increase that's been happening, particularly in the women participation and the increase in clubs, etc. And I did thought it was kind of funny that I wondered if the AFL employed the same social media um, experts as down at Port Adelaide because it was incredibly tone deaf um, with the way that they released it. They tried to spruik it and it was just after they'd had AFLX and pretty much every response I saw on Twitter to it was, so why aren't you spending money on the women if that participation has increased? Why did you throw it towards the AFLX? Well, uh, there's so many questions about the AFLX. We could have a, a whole show on it, Nick. But the simple fact is that um, Gillen's got an agenda um, and I think, I actually think that they think AFLW is going to look after itself participation-wise um, because it's so new. Um, and we know the AFL don't like spending money on game development because we've seen consistently low investment in grassroots footy in traditional football states. Um, and I'm with you. I think it's going to come back to bite them eventually. Um, and I think the overall participation numbers um, are actually artificially inflated by the influx of, of girls and women playing football and it masks yeah. a worrying trend on the male side because uh, the male participation rates continue to be a concern. And the other thing that came out, um, I think it was today, was the the salary increases that, that have occurred for AFL executives. Um, and yet they've lost money. Um, in terms of profit, they're claiming that's to do with the purchase of Marvel Stadium, et cetera, and some of this kind of stuff towards that. But there's been a significant increase um, in their executive payments. Um, they won't release what Gillam McLaughlin is on. And, of course, they don't have to pay tax because they're a sporting organisation. Um, there's an awful lot of money that was going on there that I think is raising a few other questions as well. I actually thought well, as an incorporated body they had to release the CEO's um, salary. I don't think they do. No, they apparently do. they don't anymore. No, they, they, have to they release the amount ruling. paid. Yeah, they only have to pay the total amount paid to, reveal the total amount paid to executives. And then they also won't say how many people are employed. So that then also makes it kind of difficult to figure things out. Mm. However, Speaking, if, they, if they were a company, they, then they would have to yeah, reveal it. Yeah. Speaking of money, uh, the AFC, Adelaide Crows, we had our AGM last week. Um, of course, riding high after Kim Ryder's election as uh, member of representatives. Um, and I have had a, a, an undertaking from Kim that he will appear on Crowcast regularly if he gets the approval of the club, which uh, Ian Shuttleworth, if you're listening, come on, mate. Um, but uh, the Crows posted a really nice uh, profit, uh, wiped all our debt, and uh, looked to be going forward nicely. Well, uh, you know, I think it's all very timely too because um, um, it would appear that they have been negotiating uh, for a move from Westlakes uh, for some time now. I think they were talking about maybe the last eight months or so they may have been talking on the, on the side uh, to the council and other people as well. So. Um, I think it's inevitable that will happen. And uh, from my point of view, I think uh, we were talking earlier about West Lakes with all the stands knocked down and uh, it'll just really be a, a, a public park, really. Uh, and I think that uh, the sooner that they can move out of there into their own club rooms with the, the ovals, which would be behind them in the parklands there, I think the, the better, actually. Well, so you're assuming that the Aquatic Centre is is a go, Macca? Um Ken Cunningham, who generally gets it wrong, says that it's absolutely going to happen. And but the, he is so confident on this one, I think he might be onto something there. And uh, the it is costing the council around about eight hundred thousand a year, uh, and it's due if they want to retain it, or if they do retain it, for a massive uh, amount of uh, capital expenditure to try and get it into some uh, decent uh, shape. So. 
it's just right for the picking, really. So it would just, it'd be a burden off the council's hand. Um, and apparently, there's one one little catch is the because they would use the the ovals at the back, and one of the, one of the little colleges has got a a right to use it. One of the ovals there, but black fries, black fries. But that that type of thing can be worked out. There's no doubt about that. That they hiccups along the way rather than major impediments and. Uh, so I, I think it will happen, yes. Matthew Hoare in the chat. Uh, nice to have you along. Matthew is uh, with all the other people on Spreaker and also a shout-out to Joshua on Facebook chat who's listening to us live for the first time because he's home crook. So uh, he's either a shift worker or he's uh, in another time zone. But uh, thanks, Joshua, for uh, listening in. But Matthew's uh, spotted in the last uh, Parklands Associated association meeting minutes a redacted item on the uh, minutes uh, entitled strategic lease agreement um, and as I mentioned all, all redacted so uh, Matthew nice spot there and uh, as he says uh, I smell an AFC so look there'd have to be a fair amount of redevelopment there Macca because the oval that you're talking about is, isn't nowhere near, near big enough um, so and neither are the the rooms, etc. No. What would be required? Oh so, no, it'd be a rebuild. Um, it would be a rebuild. Oh yeah, and well, not only a rebuild, be at mate. Least two, three, two, three years away. Yeah, not only a rebuild, but also they're going to have to clear some of that, uh, some of that tree growth, and uh, that's probably going to be the hardest sell because um, someone, I think it was on Big Footy or it might have been on Twitter, posted a, a, a screenshot or an aerial of that parcel of land with the MCG superimposed over the top and it probably took about or at least a half maybe a little bit more of that total parcel of land so um, you know a fair bit to work through there because you'd like to think that if they're going to move they're going to be uh, trying to build a facility that's going to be able to simulate all possible grounds exactly exactly they, they would certainly we would be wanting to do that and we've got a problem in that we're likely to go into an election. We're not going to commit unless there's actually, I would suggest, federal government money coming back in terms of um, them paying for quite a bit of it because there's no way we as a club would outlay. Like anything else, it'll involve a lot of government money. I'd say there'd definitely be stuff in from the SA government because they've the reason why the Adelaide City Council have had to do so much to do with the Aquatic Centre is because the state government built Marion. They're not interested in Adelaide Aquatic Centre at all. Um, so there would have to be some nice sweeteners, I'd say, from state government and from federal um, and very nice sweeteners. Otherwise, I don't think we'll buy it. No, I, I, I can't think you're see right, it, Nikki, to but, be honest. But I, I think that they will get uh, some support because... Uh, uh, I did read an article that Porter Adelaide already squealing about the, about that very thing might be, will be happening, and uh, I think that's unfair. And uh, they were talking about it on uh, the radio. They were saying that uh, they seem to have very short memories about how they drained the money out of this. Oh, well, geez, yeah, let's well. not have that conversation. That's another. That's not even a podcast. That's a podcast series. Um, <laughs> yeah. my, my personal opinion is that Victoria Park is still the the ultimate. Uh, venue for the Adelaide Crows. I, I'm not overly sold on uh, the Aquatic Centre venue. I, I think it's a little bit tucked away. I know it's not that far away from Adelaide Oval, but in terms of space and logistics and uh, uh, the ability and the fact that Victoria Park is already used uh, as a sporting venue uh, a couple of times a year, I don't know. I, I think the other thing that's going to be a problem in that aquatic centre location is lighting because you would imagine that they'd want to uh, put some pretty decent lights in there and the NIMBYs of uh, North Adelaide won't like that terribly much. They don't yeah, like not it at all. But it's, it's apparently 1,600 metres, Bickley, you measured it, and 1,600 metres from Adelaide Oval to the aquatic centre. But, you, but let's face it, Macca, seriously, after a game of footy at Adelaide Oval, are you going to walk to um, the Aquatic Centre to have a beer in the in the new crow shed? I don't walk 100 metres if I can get out of it. Um, <laughs> but, no, I would not. No, you wouldn't, wouldn't walk would, it. You wouldn't, would you? And no one's going to get in their car and drive. So it, it defeats... It's, 
I honestly think it's either got to be right near Adelaide Oval, which apparently has been knocked on the head because the Crows were looking at a partnership with the uni, uh, Adelaide Uni to, to hook in there and that far. Yeah, that but would have been you, great there. If you can't get that is there... A nice oval. Or if you can't repurpose, which the other the other option that I really like is repurposing the uh, the golf course. We've got one decent golf course and one crap one, and then a par three. They could mm-hmm. quite easily consolidate those two eighteen holes into one decent course and repurpose some of that land uh, for the Adelaide Crows. Um, I'd be happy with that. But if it's not within five minutes walk of the Adelaide Oval, it may as well be somewhere that's completely suitable and. You, you would think uh, places like Thebe or Victoria Park, as I mentioned before, um, would be far more suitable. I've, I've talked about the showgrounds before, which is probably not quite right, but there's far more suitable places if you can't get within five, ten minutes' walk of the Adelaide Oval. And I just I don't know whether it's uh, trying to fit a square peg into a round hole there at uh, the Aquatic Centre. The one thing I reckon uh, we can be very confident, whatever the site may be, that the Adelaide Football Club, uh, they will be very keen to move from where they are now and to be somewhere in the Adelaide, North Adelaide vicinity. And uh, then, uh, you know, in terms of funding, they, they'll also get, from the developers, I would imagine they'd get a lot, a fair bit of funding from the developers too for uh, moving out early and you know, allowing, which would allow the developers to start their housing uh, building a lot uh, earlier as well. So, uh, I and mean, they yeah. don't have to maintain, maintain things for the club, et cetera, et cetera. So, the um, oval space will always be down there at Footy Park because any development of that size has to have a particular size green space, and that is covered by the oval. I think so they'd be able to encroach a bit on, on that, though, Nikki. I think they a would be bit, able to reconfigure it uh, into, into a genuine park. Um, and probably encroach onto the oval space a bit, um, and yeah, plus obviously, no the, plus obviously the car, the the actual club rooms themselves at the moment. Uh, it's certainly, I mean, the Crows have certainly got leverage in terms of getting out of that contract, no doubt about it, because they're sitting there for thirty years as it is at the moment, and the developers have loved to get it off. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, there's leverage in terms of being released from the. Um, from the lease there i think it's just a matter of finding an appropriate um venue and i think a lot hinges on what adelaide feel is more important whether they want a state-of-the-art training facility or whether they want a facility that the fans can embrace as well um and whether they can do both Uh, my feeling is that their number one priority is to get the training facility right Uh, and it might be a matter of build it and they'll come in terms of the supporters yeah, you may well be right, uh, and, and and probably that is the priority. The main priority is to make sure that they've got, because it's all about playing football. That they've got the uh, best training facilities that they can possibly have. But you're right. I think if the space, if there's enough space, and then, then as you say, you build it, and they will come. And yeah. for me, as a fan, the first priority is a state of the art facility because we follow this sporting club for them to win. Yeah, but you know what, Nikki, I'm I've been a bit on the fence uh, about spectator or member facilities, but I'm leaning now towards um, it being an important thing that the club needs to look at. And uh, I, I think about things like being able to take my my uh, my kids down to the club after a game, or even uh, to a training session, or something like that, and actually uh, have them engage. Uh, with the club instead of just watching it on television or going every now and again. One of the reasons why I'm still a Sturt supporter is because I I was able to engage so heavily in my SANFL club as a kid. Um, mm. And, you know, it is a commercial operation these days, the AFL, and, and there's lots of revenue sources that are far more important than uh, getting a few beers over the bar. But I think in terms of harnessing future generations, I think it's important that... Uh, the club remains accessible. So I'd, I'd be really disappointed if the club didn't actually pay a little bit of credence to the value of having a facility there that is accessible to the members. I think they will. Um, yeah. Is, um, I, I was just going to say, I agree with you about that training access being or being able to see and then um, just that 
couple of interactions afterwards before they go back in the club room so they're cool down or whatever, but that's a great thing. <laughs> but having an actual club rooms, I mean, you and I, we've kind of had this discussion off of here, but that's a lot of money involved with that and is it actually worthwhile to throw almost throw that money down the drain because the way we now go to games at um, Adelaide Oval is completely different to how we did at Footy Park. Well, sometimes it's not about the economics. Sometimes it's about the the, uh, the heart and soul. And uh, mm. uh, sometimes you've just got to spend a bit of money for the intangibles. Anyway, it, it's a lot to play out in that space. So let's move on. Uh, some sad news for Luke Brown uh, in yes. for ankle surgery. So uh, uh, out for a couple of weeks. And I think Lee Gaskin actually, uh, when he was on, uh, flagged that uh, Brownie had been struggling with a with a an anger he actually thought it might have been a carryover Achilles. of Achilles yeah but you know the funny thing is that Lee did actually say ankle before he corrected himself so I don't he know did. whether perhaps mm. uh, perhaps he let a, a, a small kitten out of the bag there but uh, bad luck for Luke and it throws up a couple of uh, queries with regards to who might get that small defender spot in uh, in the first couple of rounds I think it actually opens up the a spot for Kelly I think uh, because um, Kelly is a very dogged type of player rather than, as is Luke Brown, rather than uh, a spectacular type of player. Um, and I thought he actually played very well in the last game, uh, Kelly. Um, so I, I think he's probably the one that's going to benefit from it because uh, if Brown was available and looking at all the positions, I couldn't, even though I thought Kelly played well against Port, I couldn't see a spot for him. Um, but I, I think this will probably just guarantee that he's got a spot. Yeah, it actually um, probably explains why Jake got a bit of a run last week in JLT1. Um, I must admit I was surprised uh, to see him get as much of a, a run as he did. But maybe they I had... thought he played well. Look, I thought yeah. he played all right. Um, yeah. I don't know, Donk, what do you reckon? Oh, it's sort of, I think this would have been a good opportunity for... Um... Uh, Kyle Chaney, but you know that's just me. <laughs> <laughs> Can we get a clearance from Handel? Captain. <laughs> AFL ex Premiership captain. Uh, the experience is on the door. So, yeah, pedigree. But, you know, yeah, pedigree. <laughs> um, but in 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 reality, though, is it, does this open up for a spot for one of our few little nippy small forwards or mid top yes. players that might want to go back there, like a Riley Knight? You know, let's try him in a back pocket or oh, I like or the like the Murphy can back play there. that yeah. Because he actually, his first season with us in the SANFL team, he actually played down back and he was very good. Yeah, don't mind the mullet back there. I reckon Ned could play back there in a pinch. Yes, that's uh, what a I was bit of mongrel. Ned around tackling and annoying the crap out of people. Yeah, whether he could, uh, I mean, you've got to look at who, we've got Hawthorne first up and they've got uh, a very capable. No wing guard. Yeah, no wing so guard, but they've got a very capable small battle. forward line, Nick. They do. They are actually a bit smaller and then a couple of really tall blokes. Yeah. Um, and most of their tall blokes aren't smart, so. Mac, I reckon you're right. I reckon Jake will get it. Um, but I think I, I, I wouldn't be disappointed at all if uh, uh, the mullet had a run down there. I think he's been playing pretty well. I think he's actually a bit underrated by a lot of people. Um, and people are uh, hanging out on him for a couple of uh, average shots at goal, but... Uh, he's been playing pretty well this off season, and he played pretty well last season, I reckon. And uh, I reckon we could do a lot worse. What else have we got? Um, and, and people actually kind of forget we've got Smithers back. Yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah, so because bit... you've got Smithers and you've got Miller, uh, you've still got Laird. So there's three small defenders who are all fairly good at what they do. Add in Kelly. Duday can play on a tall or a small. So to me, it actually depends on who we're actually up against as to how that back line's going to look. Yeah. Brown is a huge loss, but I think he's he's coverable. Yeah, and I still think the, the battle is uh, Talia comes back this week, apparently. Um, and then they, really that's Hardigan and Keith. They're, they're battling for one spot too. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't think it's a battle, Macca. I think Keith's got that wrapped up. Kyle looked, to me, short of a run um, and... When Kyle's short of a run, his brain doesn't work as fast as his body does and uh, I think he'll benefit for a couple of weeks in the twos. 
I'd I'd start with Keith, particularly against Hawthorne in match up from match up perspective. Yeah, we need some speed. Well, I also think that we've we've seen all we're going to see out of Harligan. Like well, we've seen what Harligan's peak is, and I don't know that we've seen what Keith's peak is. And I reckon it's if you're going to try that now, it's the time. And really when Tali point, comes back, yeah. And I just you know we need to get better, and we need to have better players. And I think Harden got us got us to a point, and and Keith's going to take us to the next one. Just yep. been changing topic, uh, PJ. Uh, he raised a very good point. He says, "How good did it look to have Brad Crouch and Smith back?" Yeah, inside? but we're not doing match review yet, Macca. Oh, sorry, mate. We're, whenever and... you whenever you start running the show, mate, <laughs> uh, the, the you're not allowed list, to mention that name, Macca. The, the listeners drop off. I see the number. The graph goes down. Uh, you know, Mrs. You Macca gets that, restless mate. in the background. Oh uh, you no! Know. <laughs> yeah. Look, let's just tidy up the news and then we'll hook into the uh, JLT. Yeah, no worries. Um, no worries. In broader AFL news, apparently uh, Walsh has already won the Rising Star. Ha! <laughs> <laughs> Carl, that's no, a win something, they're not even gonna. They're not actually going to bother voting this year because apparently he's already won it. Tell you what, he had a good game though. 28 yeah. positions and uh, 8 tackles. Look how good players can be before the Carlton development team gets to them. <laughs> now oh, you're yeah. talking. Yeah, so no no pressure on the young lad. I mean, he does look the goods, uh, but he is a an 18 year old, and uh, you know, fair crack. He's playing a, playing in a team that's going to really struggle. Uh, so to have him as the uh, as the lay down for for Rising Star, I think is a bit of a stretch. Although I have put him donkey in my uh, real dream team. Um, the Fantastic. other new, yeah, in, in <laughs> mine. Getting it wrong again. Yeah, we'll see. And the other thing is, this is getting beyond <laughs> a joke. I remember to trade, trade him in about halfway through the year when he actually yeah, when tires he falls. and they've been bashed up too much. That's right, when he falls over. Um, the other, what's going on? This is getting a bit ridiculous. We've had we've had clubs come out, uh, and particularly the Fremantle Dockers come out, and basically state before the season has even started that they're going to chase Stephen Coniglio. Yeah. Now... Yeah. What is going on? We we may as well... I mean, I'm all for transparency and I don't mind free market trading, uh, you know, a.k.a. the NBA system or whatever. But we can't have it both ways, I don't, I don't reckon. You either throw it open and let clubs talk to players all through the season openly and uh, the spectators will, and the fans will get used to that over, over a short period of time or you honour the current system and honour the fact that clubs aren't allowed to actually talk to players during the year, even though they're allowed to talk, obviously, to managers. Um, and can we just calm the rhetoric a little bit? Because the season hasn't even started. I thought that was totally disrespectful, what I read in the paper. If that's what was actually said, I think it's totally disrespectful. And, like, even if you've been asked that question by a reporter... You do a straight bat. You don't do that before the start of the season. No, that's it's, my point, Nicky. Yeah, it's just not on. I, I like, mean, when, when you want to keep your little cards close to your te- chest and not tell every other club this is what we're going to do. And you've got to feel for Stephen Coniglio too. Like imagine being that player thinking, oh, God, I've got a, f- a whole year of fighting off those mugs from WA. Like, yeah. How good is he going? Yeah, I just think it's. I think the AFL need to take a position on this, and as I said, they either free up the whole system and allow you know this sort of stuff, uh, a, a la the NRL and you know overseas sports, or they crack down on it and let guys actually play football and let the fans actually support their teams during during the season without all this speculation. I mean, everyone remembers how. Bloody heart wrenching it was going through the danger field crap. You know, yeah. other teams have experienced it as well. And we're not naive. We know these things happen, but I don't think it needs to be in the public domain, particularly before a ball has been kicked in anger in, in the current season. Yeah, no, that's, I 100% agree with that uh, situation, Fiend, because uh, it's, not, it's always going to happen behind everybody's back. But I don't think it should be played out publicly before the first, even before the first bounce. That's what I think is disrespectful. It's actually treating um, GWS uh, with, with total contempt, you know, like we're going to get try and get your player. And, uh, but yeah, we, everybody knows you're going to do it, but just don't keep uh, shouting it out to the crowd. Yeah. 
Uh, agree. Anyway, look, that's probably the news, um, and we've got lots to talk about in terms of a couple of really good games uh, on the weekend. So let's head straight into some match talk, shall we? Winners are grinners, Nikki, and we had a massive <laughs> win, massive, massive win against a team that everyone thought would uh, win by the length of the straight in AFLW this year, um, and we smashed them. And yet I spent most of that game, and you have marked this cast as explicit, I hope. Yes. Because, uh, yeah, basically... Most of the time when we decided to kick it or handle to them and Ebony Marinoff, I was, uh, I just kept yelling, oh, for fuck's sake. <laughs> um, it was so frustrating. And then at the end of the game, I thought, we actually played shit and we won by 34 points. We didn't play shit. Did we nah. play? Yeah. Oh, I didn't think we no, played for, shit at all. No. no. I reckon you're... For me, I thought we could have played better than what we did. That was yeah. not us actually as to how we can play. Nikki, um, when you watch a game, stop drinking. You'll see it a lot better. <laughs> I don't drink at all. I'm allergic to alcohol. Um, Maybe you should I, start I drinking. I actually thought... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you might get vomiting it in your direction. Um, I thought North Melbourne actually did really well in terms of the pressure, and they didn't play badly either. Um, but we did... I was not happy... Okay. I've liked Clark how he's picked teams and how he's kind of structured up a little bit for the opposition that he's playing and also the conditions we've been playing with. But I think he did a disservice in that first quarter a little bit too much to try and fit towards north because we had Foley who's been brilliant in the ruck. She would take the centre bounce and then immediately go to centre half forward. Chloe Shear was then pushed up into the midfield. Um, we made structure. Ange Foley then had to go into the back line, so we lost her out of the midfield when she normally does a nice tagging job, which can free up Phillips and Marinoff and Hatchard a bit more. And I think he then had to adjust it back a little bit because they got some goals from our stupidity, um, but they still had to kick straight to do it. Let's not forget. Um, let's not forget that North were a bit of an unknown quantity, Nick. Uh, yes, you know they had a little oh, bit of exposure. They haven't form. been for four weeks. No, no, no. We, they haven't we been know for how four they weeks, play. But yeah. uh, it's a lot easier oh, yeah, no. to come up against a team a second or a third time. Uh, you know, you know how they coach. You know where their strengths and weaknesses are. That North, you can you can watch them and you can scout them. But until you're actually up against them, uh, yeah. you don't know the new. Oh, look, I, I actually think that your. Um, I'm being very harsh. Well, I think you're being technically correct, but not every game is perfect. And no, essentially, North appear to be our main rivals for the for the flag this year, and we beat Could them. Could be interesting though, well, yeah, because I'm... if they win, if, if they win this weekend and Fremantle win this weekend, they then play each other in the last round, and I think that game's actually over in the West. Well, we've seen off both those teams, and we've seen we them off pretty comfortably in the end. Um, and notwithstanding the fact that they've had a chance to see us as well, so I'm sure they'll develop some counters. But um, you know, at this stage, I, I feel like it's we our our ladies' team plays what I would call A grade football at the moment. We we've Definitely. we're moving we're moving away from the the kick it and run and kick it and run and kick it and run. We're moving the ball. Clark seems to have instilled a bit of system into the team. I think our structures are generally pretty good. Um, our star players are all performing. We seem to be pretty much injury-free. Um, and we have some genuine talent. I mean, Chelsea Randall and Aaron Phillips are standouts. Daniel Ponta continues a good form. We've got, um, what's her name, the uh, young lass, Chloe Shear as well, that's yep. really developing Eloise well. Eloise Jones. So... There's a lot to like, plus um, the ex basketballer in the in the ruck. And sorry, I'm hopeless with names tonight. Um, That's Jess Foley, Jess Foley, and then you've yep. got Anne, yeah. Anne, and then you've got another ex basketballer in Anne Hatchard. Yep, and who's just come out of the blocks this year. Yep, uh, just taking it to another level. Look, I, I think um, 
I think we're, it's a credit to not only the girls but also the coaching staff around the girls team. Um, what, uh, Nikki? What's the what's the politically correct? Is it girls? Is it ladies? Is it women's? Is it pe- people <laughs> well, of a different gender? What, what are we? What is no. it? No, <laughs> it is AFL women's. But um, I know in the club they refer to as the girls team because they're also called the boys. Okay. And we call yeah. them the boys and the girls. So I, I have no problems with happy it. With the girls? And you hear it all the time. Yep, well, happy I th- with the girls. I, um, I think it's a, the, it's a credit not the, only to on the girls point. but also to the coaching staff, how well they oh. are playing. They are a cut above. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you because, uh, uh, I, you, know, you know, Nikki was talking about he, she thought that uh, Clark had it wrong in the first quarter. But he's mm. smart enough to get it right in the second quarter. Yeah. yeah. And have it right oh, again. Oh, yeah, and that's what yeah. I like. And then again, he made a couple more changes at half time, and he's got it just super. And they were like a machine after half time. Absolutely. Well, yeah. North, and it's, North and it's, Tired, we are fitter than anybody in this comp. Well, there's, I think there's definitely a fitter thing, but there's also a, a structure. There's a structure and a matchup it's structure. thing. So, yeah, it's so we, if you if you look at the way we kind of get all our goals, is we we all our forwards seem to push up a fair bit. Um, and then across that 50, um, the ball sort of scoots out the back and the and our quicker players are just bolting through to it. So it's not not necessarily always your lead-up forward type. So it's just that we play a very different structure and we don't necessarily have to take the first clean possession. So we don't have to take the mark and we don't have to do that, but we, we're spreading from contests really well. And we're um, uh, and I know they said it about 7,000 times in the commentary, but uh, our use of handball... Um, isn't just slow and stilted. It's it's actually moving the ball out to a person that can get a decent kick away. So I think I think there's I think we're getting a lot better effective possessions, um, and we're not seeing the sort of under tens follow the ball around like they used to. And uh, and I think we've just got a better structure going forward where it's not it's not going into a quagmire. It's going into open open space, and we're having a bit more room to move with it. Yeah, because he's put he has put in the forward lines. He's filled it with players that have got pace and. Uh, and they're actually and they're uh, clever. Then and then they're, they're good footballers. footballers. They're, they're good clever footballers as well. And and if you haven't got the structure, there's only one tall there. That which yeah. is which is Sheer, who is I you know she's, and she's a, not that tall. No, yeah. but she's but she's you know a very good player in the making, I think. Um, yeah. And what she does is she she's the bolt there and uh, going for the, for the overhead marks and uh, uh, stopping them to take easy marks. And then we've got all these. Uh, Little speedy crummers all over the place yeah. there, and I, I just think he's and most and two or three. There's I think it's about at least three moved from defence into into the forward line, um, yeah. and very very smart by Clark. I just think he has got the, a, a very good structure, and he and he uses his players very very well. And uh, yeah, uh, you know, Correct. he's just he's just improved them by goals just by the way he's done it. Correct. It, um, puts a big question on what we do with. Perkins going forward because uh, you know um, the way that forward line's moving around really quick. Do we need that sort of? Um, she can't get in. She can't get in. Yeah, I just think I think she, I think it just slows down the forwards too much. Yeah, and that's and that's the reason. I mean, unfortunately for her, um, she's overweight and she's slow, and that was a problem in the first couple of games where some of the balls were getting cleared too far too easily, far too easily. Because so, uh, Moana, Moana Hope has had to lose a lot of weight and she's fined down a lot, as you saw. But oh, you saw how we dealt with her and she's a very good footballing talent herself. Um, she didn't get the most out of herself at Collingwood because they didn't quite know how to use her and um, they were trying to isolate her one-on-one, but every other team just knew, no, nah, that's where the ball's going to go. So I kind of see that there's that similarity a little bit uh, with Perkins that those type of players don't quite suit the way it seems the AFLW game plans are going because oh, we're definitely not more skillful footballers. Um, we were still bombing it in every so often the forward line because Jess Duffin, um, I thought she had a very good game as well. But I think we were okay with her getting that because, as I said, we then pressed up high. So she was kicking the ball out, but it was – coming straight back in again. Um, Scott Gowans, who's the North coach, he actually said in um, his aftermatch presser that nobody spreads as hard and as well as what we did. They knew we were going to do it, but they didn't know we were going to do it that well. And they could not cope. They could not cover it. Now, Josh, in the uh, Facebook chat, 
asked the question, do you think we uh, relied too much on Marinoff, Phillips and Randall? I don't actually, I think that might have been true in the past, but I think we've got a very even spread this year and I think uh, yeah. we've got a lot of uh, uh, of the girls that are contributing. Uh, yeah. and we obviously have some stars. Every every team has their stars. Um but I feel like we've got contributors on every line and there's a lot of unsung heroes uh, in that team, or not heroes, but unsung players in that team uh, that are doing their role week in, week out. And I actually think this year we're not as reliant on Aaron and Chelsea as we have been in the past. I, 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 I couldn't agree more. I think that's the... I think that's the... The, uh, that's right. Um, I th- um, couldn't agree more. <laughs> the strength of our side <laughs> is the fact that the ball now spreads across... It's spread across so many different players, and it can go to so many different contests now. And we're and we're still winning those individual contests, and it doesn't matter sort of who's in there. Uh, whereas before, it used to have to be at hitting a, a Marinoff or a Phillips in the contest for us to have a chance at it. But now everybody's everybody's getting the ball out, and we're all and we're looking pretty good. One thing is interesting, I reckon, it's, is how good Ponta's going to end up being. Um, oh, so good! <laughs> every every, every yeah. game she plays, she just gets better. And yep. and just that confidence already. Did you see that handball when she was sort of lying on the ground and just sort of extended up as um, Stevie Lee was running past her? Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it was just a, just a very clean clean hand. So yeah, so. I, I, the way we're playing since Clark's been uh, taken over, I, I, th- I, I thought it was a, a bit of a, uh, a chore watching them last year, but uh, this year. With the style of football they play, I reckon it's been, been very, very enjoyable to watch. Well, no disrespect to, to Beck Goddard, but I think she probably um, not ran out of ideas, but she probably built the team to a certain level. And, you know, given that she was our, our premiership coach and whatnot, it would have been quite easy for the Crows just to, to give her the benefit of a couple more years. And I know that she had other irons in the fire as well. Um but uh, I think it was uh, very good by the club to uh, progress and to use someone that had been in the AFL system for a while, and I think the girls are showing the benefit of that. Mm. So we've got GWS next week, uh, a bit of a mixed bag they've been so far this season. Um, but Yeah, uh, they, they still play hard, but they play that older style of game plan. Um it's interesting. The narrower grounds don't suit us as well. And Unley's, I think, a little, is Unley a little bit wider than Norwood? Yeah, it'd be wider, but I think it might be a touch shorter. It's a rotten yeah, over the but, we, but we like that width because um, that's one thing North did well is we didn't, we weren't able to cut into the middle to open up the space. So they did stop us doing that. So, um, but I, I think GWS, are, even though they've got some really good players, I mean, there's there was a great hit of, that involved Courtney Gum on the weekend, who is a South Australian player um, for GWS, <laughs> that you could hear the, the, the slap as the bodies collided um, through the effects mic. But I, I think they're going to have a bit of trouble with us. So it could be a very nice percentage booster, but... The way the girls reacted after Aaron kicked that goal, um, after the siren, even though, you know, we were so far in front by that stage, it was like they'd won a final. I think the, fair, the fair way that Clark's now. got them, yeah. oh, I well, don't think we're going to be hard to off. stop. Hard to stop. I, I, but they, they spoke in the post game presser about, you know, that first loss of losing by a point and how um, we've. You know, it's such a tight competition with only seven rounds that any mistake is a big one um, and how they're playing week to week now. So I think they're just building and building and building and you can just you can just feel that energy. And it was probably uh, two weeks ago, I reckon, when they beat Geelong um, and you saw the, the gusto that they sang the club song with yeah. uh, on that oval. And I reckon just from then you can just feel that there's just a different pulse going on at the moment and yeah. you can just feel it. Lots of momentum with the uh, for women at the moment, and good on them too. Can I one more Nick, and then we'll move one, on? Yep, one little thing. So Vardy Magic raised a point, and we've just covered over a little bit that kick after the siren, but the lead up to that of that intercept mark by Eloise Jones to hit the ground running and stab pass it to Erin on the lead was you wouldn't see that that amount of skill would not be. Um, 
you would see that in the AFL and the men's. It was Miller alike, something like wasn't that. It, it was beautiful, and out. and that's what I love about Eloise. We've got Eloise Jones and Chloe Shear, and congratulations to Chloe Shear on being a two two in a row rising star nom, yeah. and another fun um, little video up on the club website about her finding out about it. Um, so our future is looking quite nicely, but as in everything, no injuries. And you know what? They're fun to, they're fun to follow. Um, it's great energy. Uh, they're all committed. Fun to follow. Now, on the other side of the coin, um, we had a, a, a less important match, um, but a good one nonetheless, uh, playing Port uh, up at Piri in 960-degree uh, heat. Um, <laughs> and uh, after a bit of a lacklustre start, pretty, uh, and, you know, tailing off at the end, pretty pretty comfortable, I thought. I thought we looked good. We were goals better than them. I mean, a lot, a lot of goals better than them. We had that little slack period in the last quarter where they got the five on in. Um, and yeah, that was stupidity by Pal Pepper, who thought it was an AFL game for points and didn't realise it was 40-plus degree heat. <laughs> yeah, I think we were actually we weren't taking it quite as seriously uh, as they were at that particular stage. I noticed that Sloane only had about I think it was about fifty three percent of the game. Um, uh, in contrast to Brad Crouch, who actually had quite a lot of the game, but uh, and he's worth talking about on him, by himself later because he was so good. But um, I, I, I'm with you, there, Fee, and I thought we uh, it, it looked like a comfortable win, even though they had that five goal burst. Look, yeah, I, I wouldn't. I don't think we're troubled. Nah. Yeah, same. Go dunk. It looked and, to me like we tried it. We we busted it pretty hard the first half. It was hot. We changed yeah. some rotations, changed some matchups. They they got a few. We did something else to counter that and and kicked a couple more just to show that we we're in control and and uh, didn't burn everyone out. The other and, thing is with us playing again in only a few days' time. Um, you know, only a six day break. Um, you know, I, it looked like we. We that was our big hit out for the JLT. You know, we um, it, it, we're not going to do it twice in six days and kill everyone in that time. But I reckon that was our big one on Saturday. Well, the interesting thing about the game is that I think the margin I can't remember what it was about three goals in something like that. Um, but the scribes nationally, not just in Adelaide, but nationally, saw us as being a very very good side out of it and a side that's. They'll be taken seriously for the premiership and top four, et cetera, et cetera. And even though I said only a three-goal margin, and yet Port Adelaide, their view on that was, well, we don't really know what they're going to be. So Now, um, Macca, I'm going to create a rule on Crowcast this year. Uh, it's called the don't get ahead of yourself rule. Yeah. And <laughs> I reckon, and I reckon, because uh, don't get me wrong, I, I really, really liked what I saw on the weekend. Uh, but don't get me wrong. Uh, but... I think we're going to take the season in four-week blocks. What do you reckon? Because we've seen in the past yep. few years how quickly things can change with a few injuries, um, you know, reverses of form and whatnot. Um, I would say that we are certainly looking like we're going to make a fast start. Um, it, we're fit and firing. Uh, we look fantastic with Crouch back in. We look great with Smithers back in. Um, it looks like... Um, We've got a lot of fire up, power up forward, but I'll talk a little bit about that at, uh, in a moment. But I'm uh, going to struggle to conform with that. Well, Felix, yeah, but I've, they've, I've been looking at accommodation work. in Melbourne in the last week of September, and I can get a seat forward. <laughs> you're allowed, to, you're <laughs> allowed to take a holiday, donkey. You're just not allowed to say that it's for a grand final. But no, what I, I didn't say, but I didn't say what it's I for thought. A, uh, it's for apprenticeship, Phoenix. I said I said the scribes in the state are saying this. Yeah, no, I understand. I, I'm just saying I, I I use the opportunity just to just let's just uh, cool our heels a little bit. Um, it because is on I, Phoenix. Well, well, yeah, no. To back to back you up, Phoenix. I tried to watch a number of the other um, games in the round and got some of the footy was deplorable. Well, I switched over to the AFLW games. Because um, I actually thought they were more entertaining and kept me engaged. But we actually saw teams, we're pretty sure, who are not going to do so well this year winning. So first round of JLT is a real up in the air and I don't think you can take too much out of it if you look at results. I do I agree with you, Fiend, that there were some really nice things I took out of it, but it's very tempered by, for me, 
by expectations, knowing I don't think we were trying that hard. We were playing fairly bruised free footy for most of the players. Interestingly, Atkins was not one of those, but I think he's got pressure on um, position, which is he good. Would, yeah, he would have. Um, but I, I think, yeah, that's the way it's going. I do have to say, though, I thought our game was more entertaining than many of the others that run. I completely forgot Collingwood were playing Frio the other night. Yeah, I, look, okay. I, there's a couple of areas of concern for mine still, um, and the obvious one is the ruck. Um, I yep. felt like we were shown up in the ruck. I, I felt uh, Riley O'Brien yep. didn't do enough to stake a claim and Source did barely enough to maintain uh, his number one ranking in the club. Um, I feel like the new rules are going to heavily favour mobile ruckmen um, and winning centre contests. And uh, I just... Uh, I continue to throw things at the television when I see Source run in and try to take space instead of jumping at the ball at centre contest. He's not so bad at, at boundary and around the ground stoppages. Uh, but he's, he's really good around the ground. But he's offering yes. us nothing in general play at the moment. I think he may have picked up two field disposals or three field disposals for the game. Um, and you compare that to a bloke like Grundy or Max Gorn um, and others... Um, that, that become an, a, a more mobile midfielder. And to be honest with you, I was a little bit disappointed with O'Brien uh, because I felt that he would offer us more around the ground. Um, and a couple of times he went for marks in the forward line, which was great, but he fluffed them. Um, and I didn't see him playing any sort of link-up role. Um, and I, I actually think Runk, Ruck is going to um, be an issue for us this year. It's our weakness. There's no doubt about it. It is our weakness. Um I think with uh, Smith coming back into the side, with uh, Sloan uh, being available uh, for the whole year, hopefully, and with Brad Crouch as a, a new player, the midfield itself is uh, looks like an A-grade midfield. But, of course, you need that good ruckman to help uh, give them silver service if you want to be a very good side. Um, and Jacobs is going to have to lift his game dramatically on what we've seen even in that little bit so far. And certainly... Uh, and I was very disappointed with O'Brien, quite frankly. I, I, he doesn't ruck too bad, but uh, but there's not much else there. And um, neither Jacobs or O'Brien give us anywhere near, as you say, we were quoting the two best ruckmen there, but they, but no, not even, they don't, they're not giving as much as an average ruckman, I don't well, think. Well, look, look at a guy like Stephen Martin for <coughs> Brisbane. Uh, more than yeah, that's probably good comparison. Look at look at a guy like Mumford for the Giants. Um, yeah. Even Nankervis for um, yep uh, for the Swans and uh, what's his name from Essendon? Uh, Bill Chambers. Bill, I always get the two of those ones confused. But there's a lot of blokes ar around that can influence a contest, and I I feel like um, in situations like centre bounces and also with a new kick in rule, uh, the ruckman is going to be pivotal. Uh, in in terms of being a link up in transition, I don't think you can afford mm. to carry a player uh, in those transitions. I think they have to provide something, and I didn't see Source or Riley get involved in anything. And I'd really actually like to see them give Paul Hunter a run in JLT too, although I don't think they will. Yeah, I, I don't still don't see him as the answer either because we're talking about in he's my more opinion. mobile. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, my point, Nick. Yeah, spot on. Well, interesting, though, that we didn't ruck Jenkins until, was it, did he actually get some ruck going in the third quarter or was it until the last? A little bit, I think. I reckon it's only, only the last, I think. I, didn't, I don't remember even like rucking before that. Yeah, so I think we were just seeing how the other two went. We were persevering regardless. Um, and I do wonder, was Clark actually there or was he on the plane to Melbourne? Yeah. No, so no. Were, were they actually coping without their coach? Yeah, but come so on. So who was coaching come, the ruck? Come on, Nikki. They don't need to be coached. Yeah, they should, they should do better. No, it's got nothing to do with the coach, Nikki. I mean, they're big boys. They're not, they're not, they're not little under 10s or something like that. And uh, Source has been around. He, well, he's gone around so many times, you should be giddy. Going not, around knocking so on all Australian selection door uh, not so long ago, Macca. So he knows how to play. And I, I, I don't know. Uh, I guess we'll see how it plays out. Um, but, uh, yeah, that was... The the other area that I was a bit concerned about was our lack of uh, 
tall forward marking. Um, we scored a lot of goals, but we scored a lot of goals um, uh, through a transition play. Um, and we I think we took 12... Uh, let me think. Might have been 15 marks inside 50 from... No, 13 marks inside 50 from 50 inside 50s. Uh, Port had 12 from 37 or something like that. I still worry about Tex. Uh, uh, Jenkins is a concern overhead, uh, although he's competing harder. There's going to be a lot of expectation and pressure on whoever... Uh, who's tapping their microphone? It's not me. <laughs> There's going to be a lot... That's donkey. A lot of expectation uh, and pressure on the third tool, whether it be Fogarty or whether it be one of the other blokes, because I can't see how we're going to be taking enough marks up forward. Well, I was going to raise that, that structure. Can we really afford to play that many tools uh, as we did? Because I, from my point of view, we, I thought we had one, one too many tall in the forward line and uh, one less down on the ground. Um, I mean, we played Fogarty and Fogarty's a good We changed player. it up a little bit. I know, Nikki, uh, but at the time, when, 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 looking at a lineup with Fogarty, um, Jenkins, you got Lynch, you got Walker, and that that's four tools out of six players, and it's just too much. Yeah, I wouldn't say um, that Lynch plays tall though, Mac, and he does play up. Yeah, he doesn't. Yeah, so you, I'd kind of take him out, um, because he's either delivering it into the forward line, so there's only three tools in there, or one of them is out, and he's then in the forward line. Um, so we've generally only got three tools kind of working there so to speak um i thought i got the impression that pike was experimenting a little bit with a couple of different looks um that were happening because sometimes we had those three tall or four if you do want to include lynch and then we take them off and we go for a much smaller forward line and see okay so how did this one go um and and that's what the jlt is for so i'm going to wait and see what happens at this game on Friday because I think that's where we'll get a better idea on what that possible structure is going to be like going forward. You know, you know what, Nick, though? Uh, sorry, Mackie, you were going to agree with Nicky? No, I'm going to say it's going to surprise and say I'm going to agree with you. But yeah. it did look like he was trying different combinations in the forward line. Yeah, I don't disagree with that, but um, I don't see a bloke... Uh, up there that is going to take a mark and uh, structures are structures and that's fine and I get that but there were plenty of opportunities for a big man to take a mark uh, mm. and okay. with 666 as Joshua points out in the Facebook chat it's uh, there's going to be opportunities for one-on-one -on -one contests and I don't see a forward uh, in a one-on-one -on -one contest at the moment being able to outmark his opponent and you know, it, it worries me because I think in big games, uh, taking a big mark up forward can be a game changer. We've, we've seen it with McGovern in the past. We've seen it at other stages with other key forwards. Just the ability to pluck a grab, just a, attack the pack, attack the ball and take a grab um, when perhaps you, you might not be entitled to. Rewalt's a, a classic uh, at that. Um, we don't seem to have that player. We, we play quite small as a forward line and I just feel as if it's our one Achilles heel in terms of being able to kick winning scores consistently against teams who match up well on us defensively. Yeah, if I was, you know, about three years ago, I think it was, when Tex came out like a real beast barking everything within, within sight, I'd love to be, I think it was prior, maybe that was prior to his knee problems, but... Um, yeah, hadn't been the same overhead since his knee because he just hasn't got the confidence anymore, Mac. No, and he doesn't seem to have the same spring either, though. No. Uh, he, Maybe, I mean, well, we've talked about him. Confident. We've talked about him going up one-handed and blah blah blah. I, I don't know. I, I don't rate Tex as an overhead mark. He'll take one or two. Um, and, and it's not Jenkins' strength, as you quite rightly pointed. The one that one hadn't got a bad. So Jenkins, hand. Uh, to be fair though, Jenkins was actually so much better at that last year, and he oh. was taking those marks last year. He was actually taking quite a number of contested marks, and Strange. he learnt to use his body a lot better. But this game, he was so rusty. I, I put him and Hardigan, they were just like off the pace. Yeah, yeah the ones, but Jenkins marks generally are out bodying them and, and often taking them, you know, around uh, eye level or chest level. 
Sorry? I said true, okay? They're very true. Oh, oh okay, that's worth a drink too. Um, but uh, <laughs> I reckon Fogarty's the one that's got the decent pair of hands and, the, and that can take a good grab. He's not a pack splitter though, is he? He he he's very much like Tex. He'll get it on the burst, but I don't see yes, him standing the in burst, a pack. Yeah. I don't see him standing in a pack like a Charlie Dixon or a or a Jared Ruffhead or someone like that. Um, anyway, the, uh, aside it from that, doesn't matter how you get him though. I think though, Fee, we still kick the hundred points. And uh, look, that's uh, true. Like... That's true. But you know, big blokes that can take a mark don't get any smaller when everyone's buggered in a final macker. Well, that, yeah, that's when it might show and Most up. of them were sitting on the bench for most of the last quarter. Um, look, but there was tons of positives. So let's talk about Brad Crouch, first of all, because it was just so oh. good to see him running on top of the ground. Still, absolutely class. Just looked like he had not missed a beat. Well, you try, that's, again, you, I have to agree with you, Nicky. <laughs> this is, hurt, this is, is hurting is, me. Is the world going to stop? <laughs> no, but he... Uh, uh, I just thought as the game went on, he just got better and better and better. Um, and he certainly wasn't running out of any puff. So the guy's got himself pretty fit. He's and fit. Matt Crouch now loves to handball to him. Yeah, we'll see a bit of Crouch to Crouch again. Um, I thought Matty worked himself into the game. Speaking of Matt, um, uh, I still have that criticism about it, the lack of penetration and, and aggression in his disposals when he's not 100% confident. Um which was a bit of a criticism of his last season. But uh, hopefully with a few games in, he'll grow. I thought Sloaney looked fantastic, considering he only played pretty much half a game. I just thought he looked ripped and ready to go. Um, I thought our smalls looked really good. Uh, Eddie Betts uh, looked like he was fit and firing. Uh, I felt Lockie Murphy played a right. Uh, I thought Keith down back played a right. I thought today looked really, really good. Uh, oh, classy. Absolutely Really, classy. really good. I mean, we forget that he's only played 23 games or something or other, but he looked he looked. And, and he was controlling that back line. 14 yeah. in this, 14 he, he was the one in charge. That is, that's, that is amazing. 14 interceptions. Yeah, just just a, uh, he's just a, he's a gun. He's a gun. Look, it was also good to see uh, Rory Atkins really put on a defensive display. I counted a couple of smothers and a and uh, a lot of aggression tackles. at the ball. Yeah, tackles. Yeah, um, and uh, he looked. I uh, did. You guys actually have to do a double take and go. That's actually Atkins. He looked slimmer. Uh, not much. Yeah, no, I didn't. I wasn't taking that much notice, Nick. But I did notice that he was uh, hungry uh, yeah, a lot more and aggressive, uh, and he puts on those sort of performances. And he's got a wing to himself. Um, and the other one to come back. Hello, uh, new recruit Brody Smith. Bloody hell! How was the barrel? <laughs> he's had Bloody little... text dropped it. How much of a weapon is he going to be in those kickouts? Oh, he's got, a, he's got a leg, hasn't he? If if that comes off during the, the home and away season, like so, let, so let's go around to SCG. Um, Smith kicks it out from <laughs> kicks it out in the centre. Tex, Tex marks it at the other end of the square, and then there's the two kick. It's two kicks in the back line for a goal. Yep. That's we fantastic. we could see donkey. You're right. We could see a two kick goal because because yep. Smithers will roost at the centre half forward if he gets fifteen to twenty metres away from the the goal square. And we know yep. where Tex can drill him from. Yeah, well, he, he kicked on in the last in the last time we played Sydney over there, so it's 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 not outside of the realms of possibility. Yeah. Actually, that goal that he kicked uh, from fifty in, uh, on the boundary, uh, that yep. was a, that he didn't even kick through it. Yeah, he just placed that. It was a beautiful kick. Um, so look, tons to like. Uh, it was JLT. Um, it is very early season, and I have put the Crow Cross four game uh, limitation on projections. Uh, but considering we've got a couple of tough games early on Hawthorne, uh, first up, uh, it's good to Am see allowed, us up and firing. I'm allowed to say if the flag was played in four weeks' time, we'd win it. No, because that's Port's go, Macca. Yeah. <laughs> Port like being March Premiers, we know that, and let's give them their moment. Uh, okay, but we're the winner and crouch on that. We want to be September premiers. We've been messing around now for two or three seasons with this squad, and uh, the time is now. But uh, first things first, 
Let's get into just a on, good uh, Just on board, position. though, uh, the one player they had was Butters. Um, geez, he, he, they took him at pick 12. Um, it's really it would be interesting to see whether he is a better player than Chase Jones or whether, whether we got it right with Chase Jones. Well, the word is we were into Butters. Well, we were, but we were going to take him with our second pick. Yeah. So, and then Port have intervened because they just had that one uh, couple of spots ahead of us all the time. Um, but, uh, gee, I did like the look about us. Yeah, it looks, uh, Dersma as well looked all right. Um, I was Star, just started wanna... very well, Dersma, but he, yeah. he faded a little bit as the game went on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it and looks they a likely type with though. young players. And, but I thought Connor Rosie was a little bit of a disappointment because he could play better than that. Oh, I, Connor played pretty well in the under twenty threes game. I thought Macker, and uh, it was I don't know whether they were necessarily playing in position the whole game. I, I wasn't really no, keeping track, but I don't think he was that's playing a good in point. position. No, I think he was a permanent forward, so um, he'll, he'll be fine. I reckon he, mm. it, he'll be fine. He's a, he's a good lad. I wish we had him. Chase Jones never got a lot, uh, a lot of time on the ground, and, and I thought he wasn't too bad when he was on. But he did some uh, very nice things when he was on. And what do you get, about 15 left? touches in about 40% game time, I think? Something like that. Well, well, he, he actually took a contested mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And a lovely left foot pass for that, uh, that goal. Um, and what I did, that was a left foot kick, uh, uh, goal that he kicked, actually. Um, very quick reaction time. Oh, he'll be all right. But, it's, but oh, geez, I was extremely impressed. But as a little animal, I thought he was really good. Yeah, very good. Look, the th I think the difference, and uh, someone, uh, PJ, said it on the chat, uh, the difference is that Port are going to be relying on those youngsters very early on, uh, whereas we've got the luxury of being able to ease our young players in. We still didn't haven't seen much of Gallucci this preseason, um, you know, and he's uh, he's probably vying for Richie Douglas for a spot, I reckon. Uh, what do we think about Richie Douglas? Uh, I, I actually don't have him as a, in our best twenty-two anymore. Well, they've got him in the in the lead, the leadership group, I think. Yeah, yeah, but that's so that's so he can lead the SNFL team with Matty Wright. <laughs> yeah, no, look, I, it, it, Doug has been a great servant of our club, so I don't want to sound disrespectful, or dismissive of him, but he, uh, I just he for me, he's in the Harlequin boat where um, I don't think we I don't think we take the next steps. we are having those blokes in our team. I think we need to. I think we need to chance our arm with young talent that wants to prove itself, that's hungry um, and that, uh, you know, wants to take the next step. And I think the last, you know, three premiers have all been sides that have given the youngsters a chance and shown their hunger and, and it's been a good thing for them. So I think we should follow that mould. Yeah, PJ said, like, he was horrible early, but then he kind of worked his way into the game and he became good later on. I, I think he shouldn't be in the best 22, but it will depend on injuries, depends on if we need a bit more of a, a harder body somewhere that we can mix around. So we know he can come in and play at a particular level, like you said, Donk. But I think primarily I would love to see him be playing actually more in the SNFL this season so that we are pushing those younger players through and giving them a chance. If his spot is half forward, I think we've got better options. Uh, and I yeah. can't see him having huge midfield minutes this season. I don't see him coming off half back. Uh, and I, I, as I said, if if he's part of that mix, out part of the mix uh, in the mid to small size forwards, I think we've got better options. So we'll see. Uh, they might keep him handy the first few games while while they see how few of the younger lads uh, go. Um, but uh, I don't think. I don't think he's best 22 anymore. Uh, and like you say, Donk, massive servant of the club, club champion, et cetera, et cetera. But I think he's been on the way in the last couple of years. And I think this might be the year, uh, along with one or two others, where he fades somewhat. So In the week, go I was on. just going to say, in the week coming up uh, against the Giants, um, Tali is putting himself up for selection, which means that you'd think that... Uh, one of Keith or Harding is, would have to drop out to, to make room for that. Now, uh, and Green, Greenwood's also and, um, kind of imitated that he's going to be playing a game this weekend, but because we've also got the SNFL game on Friday night, so I'm yeah. not sure whether we will ease him in through the SNFL or whether we'll put him straight in. I think he's been nominated that he, he will be SNFL. Okay, uh, good. And 
and could, but Gibbs will be coming in, which probably means Paholgi will drop out. Yeah, well, how do we see Paholgi, by the way? He look, he he does some decent things, but he just doesn't do enough, and he's not quite quick enough. Let's get some games in him, make everyone think he looks yeah. really good, and then trade him at the end of the year. <laughs> He's actually an exceptional mark for his size. Strong. Yeah. Um, yeah, he's really strong marker. And I think he needs exposure at the AFL level because he's doing quite well in the SNFL, but it's that step up is a different speed. He's not going to get that contest and the bodywork that's needed for a midfielder in the AFL. I think we need to get some games into him in the AFL. Yeah, just I just to see how he goes. And considering looking at the A grade midfield we've got, I think he's one you can put in there and yeah. carry him through for a little bit. Maybe I don't know. I just I, I'm not I'm not anti him, and I think he's a bad player. In fact, the reason why I was saying the trade thing is is I think you'll have some currency. Let's uh, look. I don't. I've got. I think it's actually smart to pump some extra energy and effort into these guys and some games to make them tradable and get better assets so we can get higher in talent. I just don't think. I don't think his ceiling's high enough. I don't think uh, he's taken enough of the opportunities that he's had when he's played AFL. And um, I think he looks just that little touch, little slow. So rather yeah. than just being another bloke we delist in three years' time, let's let's make him let's make him tasty and trade him off to Carlton for the second rounder next year. Uh, Not, bad. Got that one. <laughs> Not bad thinking, Don. Uh, uh, Don't think we have that. their second rounder? Yeah, uh, we do. I hope Galucci gets a game this week. I'd, I'd like to I think he play. will. I, I think they have. Uh, I think they have plans for the Gooch. Uh, he delivered, I think, last year when when asked. I think he did quite well. Um, I'm I, with I you on they Paholke, rest, though. They rested him. Yeah, I'm with you on Paholke, uh Donkey. I think he just is he's a yard of pace, short, isn't he? Um, yeah, just got just a lot that, of good qualities. Just a bit. Just, yeah, he'll look um, great in the Gold Coast jumper. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we really got, wanted to come here though. Now we've got GWS coming up uh, this weekend, and uh, before we start talking to the game, I got a lovely little message uh, from one of our new patrons uh, this week, Pam, who runs the Canberra Crows Supporters Group, um, and uh, this is the kind of, this is the kind of interaction that I love, guys, from supporter groups around Australia. Uh, Pam wrote to me uh, saying that she loved our Crowcast and that she uh, helps run the Crow Supporter Group in Canberra and she wants us to give a shout out to anyone uh, of a Crow supporting uh, bent who is going to the game on the weekend. Uh, there will be post-match drinks at the Kingston Pub. and uh, Kingo! Yeah, at the Ooh, Kingo. Oh, nice place. And oh, Pam... I have had a lot of trouble at the Kingo. It's a big club. <laughs> <laughs> So Pam and the uh, other Crows supporters there uh, at the game this week would love to see uh, new supporters there joining the group on Facebook and later on on the video that uh, gets posted on our website and on YouTube. You'll see that I've just put up uh, their logo and their Facebook page. So if you look up Crows CBR on Facebook, you'll find them. Um, yep. Or else if you want to get in touch uh, with Pam... You can email uh, Crows CBR, so that's Crows CBR at gmail dot com, um, or as I said, at Crows CBR on Facebook. So great work, so, and, great and work. I'm I'm not sure whether this is an advantage for them at all, but I used to be a member when I lived in Canberra, and they were a great yeah. bunch. Now look, because oh, we didn't get we didn't we didn't get many games there, but I did remember we went down. There was a game in Sydney. We had a bus trip we went down we were louder than the new south wales cheer squad and there were less of us yeah now um a couple of things first of all vardy's pointed out that it's a marathon cast which is always the case when pete's not around uh, secondly <laughs> we do have a lot of um uh, supporters in the various supporter groups around uh, australia so uh whether you're in victoria south australia or uh, queensland or wherever get in touch with us we'd love to give you guys a plug whenever you're having a function uh, for a crows home game um part of the reason we love doing this cast is to bring all crow supporters together together so uh flick me an email feedback at aflcrowcast.com send us something on twitter or facebook um, and we will definitely give you a shout out on the cast and uh, give you some uh 
coverage for whatever events you're showing. Now, is there anything to be gained from the GWS game this week apart from injuries? They're a good side. No, we don't want to gain injuries. That's no, what I mean. Really is, is there anything else in it? Well, uh, we'll be up against a good midfield. I thought that Coniglio and um, uh, what's his other lad's name? Um, oh, the... Kelly. 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 No. No, not Kelly. 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 Or Taranto. Taranto. Taranto, yeah. Taranto's gone up a step. Um, yeah, he good was player. player last year, but he's gone up another step. And uh, look, they, they've got a classy midfield. And some, and even their young blokes, uh, they, they put in there, they went well on the weekend. Um, I just see uh, the Giants as another one of the good sides for the year. And, and it'll give us some idea uh, against a very good side uh, and on the road uh, how we are really travelling because. Um, while we don't want to get any injuries, I think that's very important. We'll we'll be taking it semi seriously, um, and uh, it'll be another test for our midfield. And well, I think the mid, our midfield is good, but and their rucks. But I'm going to say, and the rucks. Uh, that's that's the whole centre situation because the way they, with the uh, six 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 situation, um, winning that centre square is, is critical. I think. And then if you can actually dominate winning that uh, centre square, you're going to win it every game you play. Um, well, so, it's going to uh, it's going to send you a long way, that's for sure, uh, Mac. Uh, it'll be good to have t- let Talia have a run. Um, he'll obviously be short of a gallop, so it'll be good to get him out. Um, as you said, uh, good to have the midfield run against some quality, um, because yeah. I don't think Port had too much quality in their midfield, um, and. Uh, another opportunity to see how our forwards might structure up. And, you know, they, uh, PJ points out, uh, I, I did watch uh, Hately in particular. He did have 16 positions, kicked a goal. And I'll tell you what, I really, really wanted him in our side. Yeah, <laughs> I really, really wanted him. you and me both, and, mate. Uh, I know. And, um, we'll swap I him just, for Hulky. What? It's not a fair swap. Yeah. <laughs> He's going to be a very, very good player. Speaking He's of guns, be... how was Rankin? Oh, Jesus. Oh, that first goal. Bloody but hell. he burned out pretty quick, he didn't. Yeah, he, he... he won't, though. <laughs> no, I, look, I just I just want him to have an average old year this year, so it'd be easier to get him. Yeah, he won't. <laughs> anyway, look, but, uh, I, I don't think we should spend too much time in the GWS game. Uh, for one reason, we're nearly at an hour and a half. Uh, everyone's going to sleep. <laughs> yep, I'm tired. <laughs> yeah, but, um, I but I wouldn't be surprised, you know, it's... It, it's it's one that we could well, and it doesn't matter if we win or lose. But uh, it's not going to it's not going to be as easy as the Port game. No, that's very true. Uh, and obviously, after this week, we've got a week off uh, before the real stuff starts. So, uh, look, I think we're going to wind it up there, guys. It's uh, been an epic. It's been a good one, though. We've had lots to talk about, and it's been very interesting. And credit to everyone on Spreaker. The Spreaker has been off the boil, donkey, the last couple of weeks. Um, uh, yeah, we've we've been talking about this off the cast about how we're pretty disappointed with the effort from people on the board, but, but um, they've really backed it up. <laughs> they've I'll responded well. And, and Josh and um, uh, who else was there? Uh, Tommy on Facebook, a two man show. They've just about bumped it up to forty comments on Facebook as well. So uh, very good. Now, Donkey, well before done, we go, do you want to just plug the tipping and Dream Team uh, numbers quickly? Do you have them at hand? Yeah. Yeah, look, um, we have uh, we've got fifteen entrants already in the dream team. So if you want to join that, you will have to uh, get in pretty quick. I'll try and post the um, the uh, links again in the, the chat and put them up again. But and uh, but tipping obviously opens in a few weeks' time, and uh, we've only got five people in there at the sta- this stage. So we'd love to get a pump a few more in. Uh, you don't have to hand over your bank details to join our league, although you could send me a couple of Bitcoin, and I'll be happy. So. <laughs> Very good. Thanks, Doc. Look, we must uh, say thank you to our patrons, Megan, Michael, Nicholas, Pam, Paul, and J-Mac. That's it, guys. Uh, We're done. Thanks very much to the three of you for joining us tonight. Thanks to everyone on the cast, uh, on the chat, I should say. Have a good weekend, and we will see you next Tuesday for another edition of Tuesday Night Live. Yep, good night, all. Night, all.